All right, good afternoon, and welcome to the Patriotic Dragon Radio Show, uh, October 15th, taping of the show. Uh, one of the Patriotic Dragon programs heard on WYYZ, 1490 AM, and our new 102.7 FM. Our show this month is brought to you by Quick Burger, your hometown place for burgers, fries, and shakes. Come by and see Alex and his wonderful staff for the best food, and enjoy the patio out back with this beautiful fall weather. We're out here today, and it is gorgeous. As always, the opinions and comments are those of the guests and not necessarily those of WYYZ or your host. I want to thank Sonny Proctor for being on with us today. Sonny is running for the city of Jasper City Council on the November 8th general election. Sonny, good to have you on with us. Thanks, Will. I really appreciate you having me out here. All right. If you would, you know, please tell the, some, the listeners a little bit more about you. I know there are a lot of people in the county that know you from your previous career, but, uh, you know, let's tell the rest of the listeners about yourself and why you decided to get into, into the race for council. Well, again, a lot of people know me as Dr. Proctor. I'm a retired orthopedic surgeon from uh, over at Piedmont Mountainside. Uh, my wife and I moved here over 20 years ago to uh, set up my practice. And uh, uh, what a lot of the folks don't know is that I've done a lot of other things prior to going into medicine, uh, and a lot of those things required uh, leadership experience. So uh, the political thing, um, uh, one of my dear friends and former patients, Hazel Mosley is the one that first got me interested in city council, and uh, as a matter of fact, I would uh, at one point in time had committed to Hazel to, to, to trying to serve back in the day, but uh, it didn't work out. I was really busy, and um, when, when Allison's uh, position opened up, I thought it might be a, a good opportunity to test the waters. Well, good. Well, good. And you were talking about your your, your experience prior to the, your medical field with Piedmont and stuff. Tell us a little bit about what you've, you did in the past. Well, my father had a, a, a wholesale lumber business, believe it or not, and um, when I graduated from college at Wake Forest in 1979, um, at that time that little company was the largest distributor of Redwood east of the Mississippi, and um, my father passed away shortly after I graduated, and um, I was working at Bowman Gray uh, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, trying to get into medical school. and. Um, and I felt like it was time to come home and help my mom out. And so for about four years, uh, I was in uh, in that company. And once I got that got all stabilized, I went back and uh, uh, went to medical school, uh, which was at Medical College of Georgia in Augusta. All right. So, so with that experience, you've actually had to hire people, had to fire people, had to sell product deliver product and wait to collect your money i guess all those things and even more <laughs> yeah <laughs> we so. uh we were you know again this is in the late 70s and 80s and there was a lot of transition a lot of our product was coming over on railroad so we had to make that transition to to uh using trucks instead of rail cars it was a it was an exci- exciting time for me but uh but medicine's always been my calling so uh, also when i finished uh decided to retire from practice in orthopedics uh, I was very fortunate that Piedmont Healthcare uh, hired me as a executive and uh, I was the chief medical officer at our hospital for about five years oh, okay so now when you came here was it bef- it was before prior to the acquisition of Piedmont so you came on board when it was Mountainside right it was Mountainside it was owned by a little company called Southern Healthcare um, and um, they had been purchased from the county, um, uh, but at the same time, they were still a for-profit hospital at that time. And uh, Piedmont, that was in 1995, and Piedmont bought our hospital in 2004. So, oh, right. Yep. Okay, so you went through that transition as I well, did. which that, that had to be interesting to go from a for-profit or sort of profitable to a uh, <laughs> the, the Piedmont organization, which... Well, I'm, I'm really pa- proud of being able to contribute to get Piedmont here. Um, uh, probably one of the biggest things that's ever happened in this county was getting a not-for-profit uh, class act like Piedmont Healthcare is. Um, uh, w- when they first came, I uh, did a, um, and we had our little open house over at the office buildings. I told everybody at that little speech I gave that it was the biggest thing since Fitzsimmons finding marble in our county, but uh, <laughs> but it really has been a really game changer for us to have somebody who puts money back into our county um, as opposed to a for-profit where they're uh, giving it in their, to their shareholders. And um, 
And again, Piedmont's our uh, second largest employer now, second to the school system. So it's a really important part of our uh, community. Yeah, I mean, I've got personal experience with the, the Mountainside group as well as the Piedmont group. And uh, it, I won't say night and day, but there's definitely the, the sun shines bright on Piedmont because the organization in Atlanta and the, the ability to take patients who have more, more detailed care and having that correlation, that relationship has been, I think, I know it saved lives in this county. And that alone speaks volumes about the, the decision to, to make that transition and get them, get them in here. And so. we're really excited about moving into uh, pretty soon we'll be, uh, Piedmont's going to have an emergency room in Gilmer County. So that's going uh, to open up our uh, sister competitor to the north, uh, Gilmer County, up to uh, quality health care. So. Right. And then maybe in a few more years when we work on Fannin. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Well, I appreciate that. What I what I like to do is is some topics, and, and just in full disclosure, these are some of those, these are exact same topics that I spoke with your uh, your counterpart that's running for the city council on. So, want to you know these are information and questions I had asked from listeners sent to me via email or messaging and that type of thing. And, and on the the local issues, the East Bloss funds, of course. I don't necessarily, and I vote, was very vocal about this, I'm, I'm fully in support of the schools and the school system and our students. I didn't like the way that the East Bloss vote was placed on a, a ballot that very had very little other things on it, so it didn't get, I think, the attention. And obviously with the less than 2,000 votes that uh, were cast for it or against it, I don't think that was really good, but it's in place now. Now I think we have to utilize that those East Splash funds the very best we can for our students and for our school system. And my question is, how do you see the city of Jasper being involved in that decision as far as part of the East Splash money is to build, either renovate the existing middle school or build a new middle school? And how do you envision the, the city of Jasper being involved in that decision? Or how would you like to see it involved? Well, I think, you know, that kind of sheds some light on one of my Kind of my um, one of my key philosophies, which is to um, try to get all the shareholders involved in the decision-making process, and, and you move uh, move forward kind of codependently to make sure that um, everybody's voice is heard, and then that the the most uh, reasonable decision is reached at the end of the uh, end of the day. Um, with respect to East Blast, and again, this is all relatively new to me. I'm not a politician. I'm a, ref, a physician and a retired physician at that but uh, you know the school board should be the one that kind of leads the charge on that um, and um, once the decisions are being made I would hope that the county and the city and the school board would be able to work together to decide what is the most viable option whether renovation and of course that renovation would take care that's in the city limits or building a new school um, I think we have to rem remember that the schools are there to serve our young folks and um, it doesn't necessarily make sense to renovate a building that's a long way away from all our uh, kids um, and we uh, over the years would have to transport those kids back and forth either to the uh, west or the other parts of the county and so I think uh, all those things need to be taken into account. So. Um, um, I'd like to take the lead right now to let you know that I've already talked a little bit about health care and, and um, education is also one of my passions. Uh, I'm very active, uh, as active as I can be um, with our public school system here. Uh, I've had multiple meetings with Dr. Perry. Um, I'm also on the uh, President's Council at Chattahoochee Tech um, and I've had several uh, meetings with Dr. Mallard uh, down at Reinhardt. All of this kind of spins off of some of my responsibilities at the Chamber of Commerce, and I'd be glad to talk to you about that a little bit later as we uh, maybe address one of our other questions. But um, but but our kids are w what we have to live for, and um, and that's also a key reason that I'm um, getting involved in this is that uh, for my generation the. Uh, kind of maps been drawn out on what's going to happen in Jasper and Pickens County but we got a lot of young intelligent kids who uh, I would like to see stay here and so we need to do everything we can to try to find and create jobs for these kids and create careers for them or our kids can stick around 
That, that doesn't necessarily apply to city politics, but it certainly, um, we've got to establish a cooperative atmosphere so that we can all work together to keep our kids here. Absolutely. Yeah, and on the middle school situation, uh, there's been, and we talked about this on the last program, there's been three basic ideas or, or situations floated. One was utilizing and renovating the existing middle school that's there, which would require housing those students either at the other middle school or or some situation in that, that, that time frame to do it. And the way contractors work, I know that would be a challenge. Uh, the second thing, which I thought was a pretty good, pretty good idea, was to take the back of the existing middle school where the ropes pro, uh, program and all that is, the greenhouses, cl- totally take clear that topography and build a new campus back there with multi-level, meet ADA requirements. If it takes an elevator, it takes an elevator, that type of thing. But utilize that property and then tear down that front building, which would in turn take care of some of the ca- traffic through fare issues that the DOT sooner or later, one of these decades will actually address, <laughs> allegedly. So, you know, and then the third one, which I had have, have really started doing some research on was brought up, was a, a location up off Philadelphia Road in North Maine, uh, where there's land that's, that's there that has sewer and has water and that type of thing on it that could be something that could be acquired. And then in turn, maybe sell that existing middle school to a developer and do something similar to uh, actually the people who talked to me about it were the people that are at the city of Roswell. They took the old Roswell High School and turned it into condominiums and, you know, some office space, that type of thing, and got top dollar for it because of the prime location and, you know, all the, everything was there that those type people needed. So, uh, so you know, some, some, some nice options. Uh, any of those or anything that you've heard from constituents or people that you've talked to? No, this is all kind of relatively new to me, and, and um, uh, I've just really started exploring what the options are for the middle schools. I do know that when they uh, built the high school a few years ago, there were some surprises that turned up once they uh, had decided on that site. I know they had some uh, easement issues, I think, and also some uh, some infrastructure problems that they had to wade through, and it ended up being a little bit more expensive than what we had initially planned. Um, and again, this is strictly by memory, but I want to think that we had to uh, raise a l- little more money to, to finish that off. But uh, it's been a while since uh, since all that went went down, and back in those days, I was sweating it out over in the operating room. So um, mm-hmm. uh, my wife was the one that was uh, uh, socially engaged at that time. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, well, good. Well, um, and, and I'm I think you had went in, t- in conversation before. I think you had either been to one of the DOT street planning meetings or one of the presentations. What did you get from the the comparison of the the DOT street plans and those proposed by that the group that was hired by the city? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, the DOT situation has been going on since the 80s. Um, and again, they've been, they've been willing to uh, or wanting to uh, devote some dollars and, um, and uh, improvements in our town for a long time. And there's been some opposition, uh, I think, politically on d- several different uh, occasions with multiple different DOT uh, su- uh, supervisors or whoever you know was involved but um, and in the new plans I think um, a couple things it number one it's good to see some energy um, being uh, developed around what's going on downtown um, with at least some uh, formulation of possible action taking place um, I think ultimately what needs to happen is is that um, we need to work together, um, county, city, and state, to find out what is the most reasonable um, option. We need to uh, include all the shareholders, and, and you mentioned renovating or tearing down the middle school. Uh, that, that would play a key uh, part of us figuring out what makes the most sense from to meet everybody's objectives and then move forward with that plan in unison. Um, and again, what I like to do is get everybody in the room and let's talk it out and with some uh, cooperation and, um, and relatively um, elementary social skills, you come up with a plan to um, move forward 
and everybody walks out of that room knowing what the plan is and then you um, reassess your progress over a period of time and um, and you can change your plan as long as the, the key stakeholders have a part in changing that and again that's just called strategic planning and um, and that's how um, cities and counties and large businesses and healthcare um, uh, corporations um, make progress. Um, and if you want to put an athletic uh, analogy on it, it's called moving the ball forward just a little bit at a time, um, not letting the ball just sit there for years and years and years. Yeah, yeah, I'll take four yards at a time, no, <laughs> no problem. All right. Um, and then I'm just going to skip down from that stuff. What can we as citizens do to have a voice in how the city of Jasper continues to grow? And in particular, an issue that I've heard good and bad on as far as the annexing of properties into the city. You know, I'm having a hard time really grasping the annexing thing. I've tried to do some reading on it. I think there are pros and cons on it. Um, I think you have to, uh, from the citizen side, obviously they don't want to be annexed and increase their taxes. Um, there's some unknown entities there with uh, tap-in fees and so forth and so on, uh, which is, uh, you know, um, kind of the, uh, if you're going to annex somebody, you want to make sure you're increasing their services uh, or the quality of their services or their access to services, and sewer is one of the big ones. But, um, but, but for different players, uh, annexation can be good and bad. Um, I think you want to do it in an efficient way where geometrically you're not spread out all over the county, and, um, and um, which isn't a cost-effective way to uh, annex, and um, where you have uh, piece of the pieces of the city that are way far away from uh, their services and they can't get to them efficiently. So I think it's just one of those things that depending on how it's done, um, you know, it can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, again, you want to include the citizens in the process. I, I know we have rules and um, laws about annexation and um, and even uh, eminent domain, um, which is some you know should be very rarely used. Um, but uh, we just need to do it in a way that makes sense. Um, and one of the keys is always communication. You want to be able to make sure that these people have an opportunity to communicate what their feelings are. And I think that's one of the things that kind of generally is hard to do um, um, with the current environment. Um, and we need to be listening to our citizens because that's who puts us in place. And uh, so. Okay. Well, good. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, I think communication, obviously, is the key to every, every relationship, whether it's uh, two individuals in the middle of a cow pasture or whether it's uh, two, you know 20,000 citizens who want to move forward and 10,000 who want it just the way it is. So, and it shouldn't be a contest. No, no, it's got to be a correlation of, of values. You can maintain the, the values of the people who want the status quo and want it the same and, and still move forward. In, in ways that satisfy the the other people, I think. Absolutely. So, um, and along that same lines, in the, the the annexing and the city growth, is the water system and sewer issues in Jasper. Uh, you know, it's been voiced as a concern for businesses, and in particular residents. Uh, a lot of the businesses that are new, or have been built new, they've got good access and that type of thing. But there's some older businesses and residents that I. Uh, that I, I, I hear is an issue. What have you heard and what are your feelings on what should be done or, or focused on there? Well, my house is 100 years old or almost 100 years old. Um, and um, I've seen the top of my sewer line um, going out Refuge Road a couple of different times. Um, and so uh, I have firsthand account of what the, the potential problems are. Um, share a quick little story with you. When Piedmont um, first came up here I, I don't know what they thought was going on up here um, they paid they paid multiple millions of dollars I know the amount I probably shouldn't say it on the radio even though it's been 10 years but it, they paid a lot of money for our hospital yeah, they did. a lot more than we b built it for but um, well, it was for it was for <laughs> profit so <laughs> that's right at the same very much for profit and at the same time um, they used to make jokes about do they wear shoes up there and do they have pine straw in the uh, uh, do they have pine straw in the uh, operating room and all these sort of, uh, <laughs> lowest infection rate in Piedmont Healthcare, by the way? But, but um, 
I think they probably got a pretty good kick out of uh, me when first time I was in one of my executive meetings down there. I said, I think it's time to get the skunk on the table. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the elephant in the corner of the room is kind of the same analogy. But um, we, need to, we need to get it on the table that we have in potential infrastructure problems and we need to identify what the, um, you know, you got a budget for these things and you got a plan for them and then you set that money aside however much it is, um, and um, it, it, and you can't do that without planning and looking at what's really going on and whether you want to do a three or a five or a 10 year or a 20 year plan, you got you, you don't want to, pl you know, have something go bad um, when you're least expecting it and can least afford it. So, so the first thing we got to do is get the skunk on the table and the people that should be doing that are the people that are knowledgeable about what's going on and um, not just kind of brushing it under the rug and, and trying to uh, act like it um, doesn't exist or that it's not a problem. The frequent repair of uh, ancient uh, infrastructures is not an efficient way to go. If you're digging up, uh, if you're digging up a little piece of street uh, and repairing it here and then six weeks later you're half a mile down the road, um, um, or if you're putting asphalt down over all these, uh, we're very fortunate to have all this new asphalt in our county and city. Um, it's not going to be real nice when we have to tear it up when something bad happens. So, right? Yeah, I mean, my my first uh, one, a listener that actually stopped me at Kroger's to impose that. One of the people posed that question to me. He said, yeah, my suggestion was if we're going to have a patchwork blanket of pavement, we should at least paint the patchwork different colors. <laughs> and right. I said, that make a nice blanket. It doesn't make much for a street on downtown. That's right. And uh, he just happened to, he not, doesn't own a business downtown, but he works at a business downtown that literally the access to their sewer was paved over twice in five years. And he said they had to dig up new asphalt to get to the tap. To, to service and clean it out so yeah i think uh, a thorough analyzing of what we do have by section by by zone or however they want to set it up because i would assume wrongfully probably that it's uh, it is set up that way in a zone and uh, that the, the water and sewer department could could probably come up with a list pretty quick of where the the oldest and where the problems i think i think are. the problem back in the 50s when they were doing this they didn't there were the they didn't have the forethought to make maps, so there, there's there are going to be some challenges, obviously. But, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the bottom line is, is we're we're, we're going to want a modern infrastructure eventually, and um, and um, reusing a lot of what's there is not going to be an option anyway. But um, right, yeah. just one of our, uh, you know, one of our things that we need to get on the table and talk about. Yeah, or as we say in business, opportunities to to move to address up. <laughs> We don't look. We don't call them challenges anymore. We we call them opportunities. Well, right. problem solving is is why we do what we do. <laughs> That's it. That's it. All right. Um. In, in along that same line of stuff, what would what would be your plan to deal with those infrastructure replacement cost? You know, I've asked a lot of people about what the monies are uh, available for that, and um, I haven't really gotten a straight answer yet. Um, but okay. but I think uh, part of that is budgeting. Um, and making sure that you set some aside each time, um, and um, uh, a lot of the answers I've I've gotten, unfortunately, would mean that we'd have to turn to the county for money. And again, they've just raised their raised their tax rate. So um, the reality of it is, is um, um, without knowing how much money you're talking about, I, I don't know how we can even talk about uh, yeah. planning. No, don't know how many jars to dig up out of the backyard unless That's you know right. how much it costs. I'm right. a, I, I presume there's federal dollars for that, but, but, but again, this is something relatively new to me, and, uh, and uh, federal dollars is not anything that I've had access to. It's usually going the other way. So. Yeah, right, yeah, and they usually have strings attached too, so. All right, uh, and then something else that, a, that a, a listener who is a business person who owns property, retail, industrial, a, a lot of properties, one of the largest landholders in the county actually posed to me was, from the city standpoint, how would you feel about a tax-exempt industrial area in Jasper? Yeah. And his example was that undeveloped area at the airport. Right. That's basically un, un, untapped, per se, that was going to be biomedical. Right. You know, so. I, think, I think we have to do anything that we can do to encourage uh, the kinds of businesses that we want to come here. And I'm not sidestepping your question. I, d I just think that we 
we need to develop some sort of open arms uh, policy about getting people to the table and then following through with what we uh, tell them we can do. I know that there are laws and guidelines on tax exempt status and from what I've heard um, it's an expensive uh, uh, way to go because the, the lawyers end up pocketing so much money and making sure that all the rules are followed. Um, but having said that, um, I, I think we need to look closely at, um, at what we can do um, and then decide um, where and how we're going to pull it together and then, and then do that. Um, my role um, on the executive uh, board of the Chamber of Commerce recently, um, since we had a resignation earlier this year, um, I've, I've been able to sit in on some of the meetings, um, including uh, Economic Development Council um, and, and some of the other meetings with local uh, business leaders. And I do think they're exploring some of these options. Um, you know, Jerry Napertal is now our, our chamber uh, executive director, and he's been the um, economic development uh, uh, leader for quite some time. Uh, again, that's that's kind of a an, a little bit of an unusual partnership, but at the same time, it 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 gets people in the room that really need to be there to start making these kind of decisions and and laying out the path that we want to go. Um, it, it's just a way of unifying our direction, which is something I think that we need to do, both city and county. Okay. Well, and there's something we didn't talk about on the show last week, but after afterwards, I was actually talking to a couple of people that had been on the show in in prior 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 sessions and stuff, and you know, the question we posed to our state representative and our local officials: Wouldn't it be amazing? If we took an area that we wanted to develop from an industrial standpoint to create jobs where people that we were going to give any kind of a discount on their property tax or any whatever we want to structure, that we put in an area in a county where we had access to major interstate and thoroughfares, that we tied in and had a technical college where we could actually train detail workforce jobs for that industry and a percentage of them being able to move into county and get a discount would be that the jobs paid x amount per year and that they were going to and hire x number of employees from our county trained at our local technical college if you had all those things in place what that could do to uh to an, an industry uh, well, so it'd be, it'd be nice if we had a you know high school and a technical college and a, an area that needs to be developed all in close proximity to each other so kind of a kind of a joke but at the same time you I think oh, you see no, where I'm going it would be awesome you know when I moved here the technical college was a booming little place yeah. and for reasons that uh, really time wouldn't allow us to go into but I'm just starting to kind of explore those uh, reasons um, um, it, it's not that way anymore and, and uh, but I think there's some key people who are um, interested in getting it back to the booming little place it once was so maybe that'd be a perfect dovetail for what you're talking about right all that requires a tremendous amount of transparency um, and um, again that's one of my key words too is that um, my life's an open book you can ask me anything you want to about my life and I'm going to tell you honestly and and I did some things when I was young that um, you know back then um, were considered brow, uh, bad I'm not proud of them now but I reflect on them as um, as an experience that taught me something and uh, transparency just being open and honest with people and making sure that they they know where you're coming from and what that ultimately develops is trust and then um, you know when someone will trust you with their life or their limb or their uh, loved one um, that's a very special uh, commitment and um, uh, even though the the stakes may not be high on a, as high on an individual basis when you're talking about local development and politics but the trust factor is something that really needs to be there and um, um, and, and then everybody gains absolutely yeah Good. Um, and then another question, of obviously, was what, what can we do to move more diversity business in, in town? And, and the statement was made to me that, you know, we've got a lot of law offices. We've got restaurants that come and go with a few anchors. And then something that's not highlighted is our medical that between chiropractors, the natural food store, and there's several other doctors in that the venue and, and that vein of, of businesses what can we do to increase that or highlight that what would what would you see us doing there 
Well, well, one of the things we got to do um, is, um, and there's probably going to be a lot of people that don't necessarily like this answer, but um, you know, our population really hasn't changed in quite some quite some time, and um, and so we need we need more folks, and then we need a commitment uh, uh, to support those things once they come in. Um, I think the um, the pride and ownership uh, of the little downtown area. Uh, we need to re-energize that. Um, um, we have a lot of uh, landholders down there that uh, don't necessarily have their businesses there, and and I'm not I'm not saying bad things about that. It's just that uh, we need to make sure that uh, we're selective in what we bring down there, and then we support it once it's there. Um, it's tough right now. There are a lot of different things going on. We, um, it's been a while since the uh, the city had a reasonable fresh up on on the on the face of the town. Um, been some things done that I think have actually uh, um, uh, detriment. I've lost the word, but uh, have been detrimental to the appearance of the town. And 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 we just need again to plan that out and lay it out. Um, you know, we had the we had the folks come in and look at the transportation study that we looked at a little bit earlier, and uh, and, and I'll also compare this to the DOT a little bit. Um, you know, if you're going to listen, if you're going to have these high-paid people who have experience at, uh, at doing this, you really kind of ought to at least listen to what they say. Um, you know, Jimmy Jimmy Carter was one of our brightest presidents, but he was kind of notorious for getting all these brilliant minds in the room with him, and then. Jimmy do whatever he wanted to, and um, and and so he didn't. He's not known as one of our greatest presidents, but uh, so you got to listen to these people that tell you how to make your town look better and flow better. Um, you don't have to do it, but you got to really listen to them and, and make hard decisions about whether you're going to go against what they're recommending because they have experience and they're trained, and that's where their expertise is. But uh, you know, the downtown area is something that's going to take some time. And uh, we do have some uh, anchors down there that have been there for a while. Um, and we just need to uh, gradually um, keep uh, making it look nicer, do, do things to bring more people in, um, again, have some transparency about who's coming and when they're coming and why, and see if the people maybe will get behind it a little bit. So, Okay. All right. Good deal. Um, that's a tough one. Well, yeah, but, you know, the thing is when you, like you say, you bring in a group, you pay pay an outside group whose job is to analyze and, and see the need. And, you know, it, it kind of a segue to that uh, detriment to downtown. I, this past weekend, be, being, a, being an Auburn graduate, I had a friend of mine who's an Auburn graduate who also happens, I was an ag major, but I was I, my, my major was agronomy. His was Arbor. So he told me not to worry about the detriment because, Diesel fuel doesn't go away, so they'll all be dead soon anyway. So we'll get well. We can we can do some metal trees like we did at Auburn after we got poisoned. So the spider mites and uh, bagworms, uh, they don't go away either. No, they don't once go away. Once they but get in those no, they, they just invite their cousins. Yeah, all right. So, but yeah, well, we, we can make a whole show on that. So I'll just. I'm, I'm we'll, a gardener too. You probably know. I don't know, but my wife and I both love gardening, and we uh, oh, yeah. we've had our struggles with Arbor Vitas. That's it. <laughs> in our in so, front of our house, Spirea so. is a much better breed. <laughs> Variety. All right. Well, um, you know, what do you see the position of the council as it as it pertains to the chamber and the downtown business group? And the reason I posed that question uh, last week too was a lot of citizens really don't understand the correlation between the downtown business association, the chamber of commerce. There's like three separate entities that. And most citizens just don't really understand why it takes three entities to do what we're trying to do. And, and how do you see the city council um, maybe focusing that uh, herd of cats in a, a different direction or in the same direction? Well, I think it would be great if, the, if, the, if they would do that. Um, um, you know, it's, um, it's kind of odd to have a physician on the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and um, so, so let me give you just a real quick background. Um, when um, our current CEO over at Piedmont uh, came up here, um, she and I were, uh, we formed a dyad, which is basically an executive leader and a, and, a, and a clinical leader. And that's kind of the trend across the country for a lot of these big systems for their hospitals. And um, even though she lives here during the week, she lives in Lafayette uh, on the weekends, that's where she's from. And 
So as one of my community duties, I agreed to be on the Chamber of Commerce uh, Board of Directors, uh, which is something the hospitals always had representation on. So, um, well, um, not not too long after that, I think I served my first year is when I decided it was time to retire uh, altogether. I'd retired from practice in 2010, but I had already made a three-year commitment to uh, uh, the chamber, and so I was on the uh, chamber board. Um, and then when it came came time to roll around, uh, Denise uh, Ray was planning on, our CEO was planning on coming on the board, or at least trying to get on the board, and at the same time, they made her the corporate uh, CNO, so so she lives in Lafayette on the weekends, she uh, stays in Jasper on the week, and now uh, Piedmont reaches to Athens and Henry County and uh, all over the uh, north part of the state, so it just didn't make sense. So I agreed to uh, serve on the executive uh, board until uh, time that um, um, the hospital could get uh, a viable uh, represent representative, hopefully Denise. But um, w subsequent to that, uh, the chamber went through some changes, um, and those were kind of unforeseen at the time that I'd made that commitment. But uh, at the same time, understanding fiduciary responsibility, I felt obligated, as did the rest of the executive committee, to hang in there and, and get through this. Um, and so that's what we've done. Um, I think the, the fragmentation of some of these leadership groups, I think, um, uh, kind of points to some of the issues that we were having over at the chamber. Um, I think there's uh, a, a lot of different uh, stakeholders that don't really feel like they have a voice. Um, uh, an example is, of course, a lot of these businesses downtown um, can't vote in the city, so they don't really necessarily feel like they um, have any kind of representation. So. But um, I've touched on this a little bit. Uh, the executive committee, uh, um, part of the reason that we chose Jerry as our executive director is to try to focus some of this energy in one direction. Um, and um, uh, just so y'all uh, understand the process that we went through in order to do that, we, we got key business leaders from out the community involved, uh, political figures, um, development authority figures, and we had a long discussion with them about, uh, number one, do we want to continue to have a Chamber of Commerce? Number two, do we want to, uh, what kind of direction do we want to see it go in? And, uh, and, and, and everybody was in unison about uh, uh, that, that we kind of needed to unify some of our energy. So we got the key stakeholders in the room. We did exactly what I talked about already. We came up with a plan, and um, and uh, and so we're moving in that direction. Um, we have had a renewed interest uh, recently um, in uh, the city council uh, in participating in the chamber and also energizing um, uh, some of the activities that are going downtown um, uh, with these little Wednesday socials. Uh, we. Um, we, we're kind of modeling that after what's going on down at uh, ball ground um, and uh, and uh, so there's a fair amount of energy that's going on about it um, but last week uh, we had uh, um, the downtown Alliance group um, and the uh, uh, I can't remember the Merchants Association and the chamber had a little meeting together to talk about the uh, what's going on down there and again, the first uh, Little Wednesday social we had was a tremendous success. The second wasn't so. Uh, we, we wanted to change it up a little bit, but um, uh, once we got everybody in the room, we kind of decided to stay the course, uh, keep it uh, uh, for the Wednesday social for this year, um, and then uh, that'll be the last one we have until next year. Have a little bit more planning uh, to do, a little more time to do some planning. Uh, we got some uh, things going on downtown that, uh, with some of our ordinance that may uh, support uh, having a little more energy on the downtown area, and um, and so we're excited about uh, um, uh, getting everybody moving in the same direction. Um, it is a little bit like herding cats, um, and I'm sure a lot of a lot of your readers, uh, your readers, your uh, listeners have seen that video of herding cats, but. Um, uh, those merchants down there are all strong-willed people and uh, entrepreneurs, and um, and once we can focus that energy, then that's going to be the start, I think, of uh, getting things um, moving down there. Um, I think this is a good time to say that, um, uh, like you said at the beginning, the, the, these thoughts and comments aren't yours. Um, these are all mine. Um, nobody um, came to me and said, uh, nobody um, from the 
nobody came to me and said, you, I, I want you to run uh, for city council. A lot of people came to me and said I needed to be running for office. Um, but, um, but I'm out there on my own just kind of figuring out how to do this. Um, uh, Mayor Weaver's been very cordial, as has the rest of the council. Um, but again, I'm not, uh, I'm not representing them or their opinions. And, uh, um, but at the same time, I, I, I look forward to working together with everybody on the council and the, and the mayor as well, because I really think that I can contribute uh, with my experience. Um, I've always wanted to do the right thing, and I like to help people. And those, those, those things, uh, and I'm passionate about things I do too. So um, I think it's exciting times for us. Um, we're just kind of on the uh, pivot point right now. So, yeah. Well, like I said, and I, that's that's definitely my hope. Is you know, my wife and and I li lived here since uh, you know 2000, and we plan on staying. And got a daughter who's who's hopefully coming back here to, to have her own business eventually. And, and and so we're in we're fully invested in the county and in the city, and we want it to be a success. And something you pointed out, and I think is critical for our listeners, we all have a voice. And, you know, voter turnout is lackluster at best in most things. Now, we'll see what November 8th holds. <laughs> but I would like to, to encourage all listeners on November 9th, stay involved. You know, show up at city council meetings. Show up at, at county commission meetings, uh, whether it's a budget, a millage rate increase, or talking about redoing a playground in the west end of the county. Every All of our input and our ideas and something you point out with the downtown area, those people that are in business, that are entrepreneurs, they've had to take and fully invest, most of them, their savings or their, their blood, sweat, and tears into those businesses. You don't do that with the anticipation of closing. You want to do it with the anticipation of being successful, serving your customers, either products or services, and then being satisfied and coming back. So for those citizens who... Maybe go outside the county for some services. I would encourage all of them to try and look at home first. Try and use our vendors, our suppliers, our shops, everything in the city uh, as a first stop and spend our money here locally and support all those entities. So, but. Well, we got a lot going, a lot more going on now. And, you know, I moved here 21, 22 years ago and um, we, had, we had two red lights then. Um, and uh, or maybe three in the in the county um, we had mcdonald's um we had arby's um we had the J jasper steakhouse which uh, i still miss um uh, because yeah, everybody that, does because <laughs> we had the bluegrass night and uh and, and uh, but maybe we can get that back but um uh nonetheless there's a lot more going on and um we don't want it to bypass us, um, but at the same time, we don't want it to overtake us or overwhelm us. So uh, that's why you need to get out and communicate with your uh, elected officials what you want to see happening. And, and, and the elected officials need to do a good job at communicating back with us, uh, the citizens, about uh, what's going on and what the challenges are and um, giving some time for some uh, positive and negative feedback on what their ideas are. So. Okay. And if people want to talk to you directly uh, or can, uh, contribute to your campaign, get uh, Sonny Proctor for City Council signs, how do we go about doing that? Well, I'm on Facebook now, believe it or not. So you can just look. And I'm, I'm, uh, I've never sent a blind email in my life. And, uh, that, and that's a true statement. So my Facebook account is totally public. Um, um, even Anybody can look on there and contact me. And um, and. Uh, I don't want to open up the floodgates, but uh, you know, when I was in practice, my phone number was always uh, listed, and I had some interesting calls. and And most folks know where I live, um, and uh, just, just get me a message, um, and I'll get you a sign. All right, sounds good. Well, Sonny, thank you for being on with us. I really appreciate it, and maybe we can get you back on uh, before uh, November eighth uh, for uh, another quick thing, maybe at lunchtime. I'd be glad to do that. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. And have a great afternoon on the Patriotic Dragon Radio. Talk to you soon.